Thanks, Josie. That's right, the dedication ceremony ended here just moments ago for the permanent borderline memorial. The Hillen Garden is now dedicated to the victims and survivors from last year's shooting. The city decided to choose Conejo Creek Park North because it's the city's most visited park. I was able to speak with a local Thousand Oaks business employee about how he thinks this will help the city take the next steps in the healing process. I think it's probably just, you know, allowing the community to uh, have a bit of closure. Um, granted, you know, it, it, no one will be forgotten, but at least it's an uh, opportunity for everyone to come together. And the next step did begin with this ceremony. The gates opened at 2.30 and hundreds gathered to honor the victims. Former and current Thousand Oaks city leaders, park district officials, and first responders spoke during the ceremony about how this memorial is meant to help the city heal and move forward. While they were putting the finishing touches on the memorial, I got to talk with Thousand Oaks city leaders and district park officials. Also, while visiting the Borderline Bar and Grill, I spoke with Michael Morset, the father of Christina Morset, one of the victims from the shooting. They all said they could not wait to make today a reality. For the past year, the makeshift memorial at the Borderline Bar and Grill has been a place for people to come and honor the victims taken in the mass shooting. It's a nice place. It won't be here forever, but we're enjoying it while we have it. While visiting the memorial, I found Michael Morset there. Michael lost his daughter Christina in the shooting, and over the past year, it's been a place he frequents to find comfort. The memorial is a way to stay connected and to escape the reality of what happened on November 7th, 2018. It's also, at the same time, a way to be alone. But after today, families of the victims and the entire community of Thousand Oaks will have a permanent place to remember the 12 lives lost that night. Something there that the public will be uh, able to enjoy and participate in. They'll be able to sit on the boulders just as much as I will. Thousand Oaks City leaders, Conejo Creek North Park District, and the Sheriff's Office came together to make the Hill and Garden a reality. And they made it happen. For city leaders, providing a place where people can collectively grieve and remember was important. We needed and wanted something in place for the one year anniversary. Because of the fires that happened just a few hours after the shooting, the community didn't really have time to mourn. The community didn't really have time to grieve. De La Pena imagines what the memorial will offer. It will be a solemn place where you can just sit and reflect. The designers of the memorial focused it on the borderline 12. There is 12 large granite stone benches. We have the central pond feature where we've, we've added 12 low bubbler jets representing the 12 lives taken. We have a picnic pavilion, an existing picnic pavilion that we um, address with 12 um, large granite boulders um, flanking the stage to kind of really frame the stage as well as a plaque on one of those 12 boulders. The memorial also pays tribute to the other people at the bar that night. There will be 248 pavers that will be a unique blend of color that will represent the 248 survivors. For family members of victims, the memorial provides a place to make sure their loved ones will never be forgotten. It's going to be there long term. And for Michael Morset, I can't imagine anything really that would be better, really. Um, I really can. And the fact that the city's going to maintain it for us, <laughs> that's just a big plus. After coming here multiple times leading up to today, it's truly been special to see what was once a vision and plan now open for the entire community to use and throughout the healing process. The words I've heard most today to describe it are to sit, reflect, remember, and move forward. Josie, Buddy, Jenna, back to you guys. I, I come here to the memorial as often as I can, which turns out to be I don't know, two or three times a month just to check on things. Um, we come because my daughter was, is, is Christina Morset. She's one of the employees that was killed here on, on November 7th last year. So I come and just check on things and see all the new stuff. And there's always something new. There's a couple new things there in front of Christina's cross today that I haven't seen before. It's been interesting, the healing process and the, you know, the, the grieving process, everything's so mixed up and everybody's different the way 
the way they were affected and the way they handle it and um, no two people are experiencing the same thing and it's it's really been it's been challenging um, but you know you always try and look for the bright side of something it's been um, on the positive side interacting with everybody and getting the, the love and sharing love and sharing you know emotions with people has been also uplifting and encouraging too at the same time so it's it's really strange how it works I know there are a lot of phases of grief um, and it doesn't just happen like one after the other and then you don't go backwards ever um, and it, do it doesn't seem for me to happen in any specific order uh, it seems to be more like uh, uh, a mixed basket of emotions like a an alphabet soup and you stir it up every day and see which letters pop to the top and that's the emotion of the hour you know and two hours later you could be totally different or five seconds from then you you see something that triggers a response um, so it's it's been like that you know chaotic and unpredictable but at the same time I try to push a little further each time and maybe not be so alarmed when something does trigger me to just understand why um, and then learn from it. Um, I'll never stop being triggered, you know, never going to want to um, hide the pictures of Christina, never going to want to take off her wristband, um, never going to never gonna be able to stop thinking about her. Um, people send me pictures all the time and little video clips and I think it's great because I get to see her smile again um, but it does cause you to go up and down a lot and I think that's natural as long as it's healthy to do go through those cycles and I think it's I personally have welcomed the next new emotion to see what happens with it um, if it's hard then I cry I might go home I might I mean I might need some extra time um, but but you get through it and and then it's you know you move on to the next moment or the next day never going to reconcile completely and come back to zero like nothing happened but to to reconcile it enough to say well here's where we are now we can never go back we can't change anything that's happened but we can learn from it we can grow from it um, and, and now I have a lot of people who care about me <laughs> And a lot of people that I care about that I never knew 11 months ago. So it's, you know, it's like the silver lining of a really, really dark cloud. It's just the way it is. Right now, we're in the week, one year later, from the borderline shooting and, you know, Woolsey fire, and people are starting to feel, you know, somewhat triggered mm -hmm. from these events. Mm -hmm. What would you say to how they're feeling? What advice would you mm -hmm. offer to them in, while they're feeling these thoughts? Well, first of all, it's really normal to have a reaction on anniversaries. There's even some evidence that people, people are more likely to injure themselves on the anniversary of a loved one's death, even if they don't remember that it's the anniversary. So trauma and tragedy can get stored really deeply in our bodies and brains and um, it's very normal around the same time of year to start to have more intense feelings about it. Use some of your coping strategies, right? So when, we, when we're feeling um, things more intensely, it's a good time to reconnect to friends and family, um, to use your faith, to use whatever your resources are, um, but to not, to not think it's strange to be feeling it again a year later. And, um, and to really participate in the kind of events that allow us to remember um, and make meaning out of tragedy and loss. People who survived Woolsey and people mm -hmm. who survived Borderline, what would you tell them about mm -hmm. maybe filling some survivor skills? Yeah, so, um, you know, the concept of survivor's guilt is the idea that people who have been through trauma or tragedy and um, emerged relatively unscathed can sometimes feel guilty about that. So acknowledging that, yes, of course, we wish it was different, but to also be realistic about how much control you did or didn't have in the situation. And um, it, it can be a matter of forgiving yourself, recognizing that you did the best you could with what you had at the time 
and it can also be just a matter of letting you know letting some time pass and in the meantime not being too hard on yourself i'm a big fan of self-compassion young teenagers mm -hmm. young children mm -hmm. who had to live through these events mm -hmm. um, as young children and you know being evacuated mm -hmm. how would they be feeling right now what do you mm -hmm. suggest for them who have to live through this live mm -hmm. with this for their lives yeah well obviously especially for younger children, um, something like an evacuation or a natural disaster is especially chaotic. And they have even less control than adults over what's happening. In part, um, I would suggest that people be guided by how children are reacting. Uh, that checking in with children or adolescents about how they're doing is a way to let them know that if they have things they want to discuss, they can come talk to you, whether you're a parent or a sibling or a teacher or nanny. Um, but to also not necessarily push children to feel a certain way because probably the children who have gone through these events from the last year, um, some of them may still be feeling effects and may still be struggling, and some of them may be fine. That we know that some, somewhere around 50 to 60% of people in the US will experience some kind of trauma in their lives, but only about five to 10% go on to develop long-term symptoms from it. So children and adults are very resilient, sort of on their own. Can you tell me a little bit more about like that theme and how people can be resilient mm -hmm. throughout this process? Mm -hmm. So resiliency is sort of defined as our ability to cope with adversity. The idea is that all of us, in, in everybody's life, there's gonna be a certain amount of bumps and adversity and problems. Nobody's life is smooth sailing. So connecting to other people, um, connecting to things that you're passionate about, and again, that can be family, it can be friends, it can be a faith community, it can be a sports team. Um, that connection to other people increases our resilience, uh, especially if we then are willing to use those supports when we need them. I'm thinking about, there's a concept called post-traumatic growth. And it's the idea that People who experience a trauma, um, if they're able to work through it and process it and get the support they need, that not only do they bounce back, but there's an idea of, that there's a possibility of bouncing forward. That sometimes people who have experienced really extreme adversity uh, will describe things like having a renewed appreciation for life, or having a new purpose, or having their priorities shift so that they realize what's really important to them and, and they have more energy and time to focus on what's important to them. It can also be finding a purpose, finding something that you want to um, rally for or a cause to raise money for. And so that's one piece of the hope that when we are able to process and transform our negative experiences, we actually can end up in a place that feels more fulfilling than we would have if we hadn't been through the experience at all.